What's up guys, it's Trey, hope you're having an amazing day so far. Today we woke up and went down to the gym, did a little bit of cardio, we came back up, had breakfast, and I thought I'd do a quick react video to Jeff Nippard's eight common fitness myths busted. I feel like there's a lot of talk on the internet, especially with TikTok blowing up and shit like that, and false information spreaded, 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 seded, learnt, I don't know. So I thought I'd watch this video, and if you don't know who Jeff Nippard is, he pretty much runs you through everything from training, dieting, myth bust, backed with science. So he goes through and looks at reports and studies from different universities around the world, so everything is fact. And just before we get into the video, I'm on the road to 1,000 subscribers. I think we're at like 905 at the moment. So if you haven't subscribed already, please do so, and while you're there, hit the thumbs up. All right, let's get into the video. In the description box below if you'd like more of that detail. Right, this uh, but without further ado, here we go. Uh, so up first Number is one. the idea that you should eat breakfast to sort of provide the nutrients you need to get your day started off on the right foot. Right. And while it sounds perfectly reasonable, and I'm sure we've all heard it plenty, as it turns out it doesn't have much scientific legitimacy. Surely your parents said you gotta eat when you first wake up to fuel your day, the breakfast is the most important part of the day. See, that's the shit I'm talking about. Like, we get told these things, but then when it comes to science, I oh, know, let's find out. Research from Betts and colleagues found no difference in resting metabolic rate between groups eating and skipping breakfast which makes up the biggest chunk of total metabolism here. And while this study did find that breakfast eaters moved around more and burned more calories during the day, this was nearly perfectly offset by the fact that they also overate by about the same number of calories because of the calories included in the breakfast meal. So on balance, under free living conditions, there actually isn't much of a difference in total daily energy balance between eating and skipping breakfast. So whether you choose to eat or skip should be tailored to your appetite and your preferences. And I think- Right, so it's not saying when you first wake up, you have to eat. It's not saying you have to fast. You choose what you wanna do. There's some people that wake up and they don't feel like eating and their parents force them. No, you need breakfast. You don't. <laughs> you don't need it. For me, I wake up and the first thing I do is piss and then make toast. Depending, like this morning when we went down for cardio, I usually like to do my cardio fasted and I'm sure that will come up in this video whether it's good or not, but lately I've just been waking up starving so I've had two pieces of toast, go down, come back and then finish off my breakfast there. Completely up to you whether you want breakfast or not. You gotta eat but oh. And if you're bulking and you're gonna get like six, seven meals in a day, if you wake up first thing, smash one, then you only have six the rest of the day. So like you said, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. All right, number two. A weightology research review article from James Krieger summarized this well. Eating breakfast is a personal preference. If you eat breakfast, make it large and high in protein. And if you don't, just make sure your first meal of the day is large and high in protein. Uh, but ultimately, skipping breakfast is just one strategy to reduce caloric intake, and you'll need to determine whether skipping breakfast helps you eat less overall during the day. Um, this has been a controversial one for me. Uh, in the original video, I laid out four studies examining targeted fat loss. So the idea that you can selectively lose fat from specific body parts. Now, the first study found that active swinging arms weren't leaner than non-active non-swinging arms in tennis players. Uh, but this study was limited by being merely observational, not interventional. Uh, the second study showed that when you only train one arm across 12 weeks, you don't find any difference in fat volume between the trained and untrained arm. Uh, but this study was also limited what? because it didn't find much fat loss overall. So perhaps spot reduction just wasn't detected here. Now in contrast, this third study did see significant overall fat loss and again, didn't find spot reduction in trained versus untrained legs. However, a new study published just last year really applied pressure to these earlier findings when one group that trained upper body only for 12 weeks lost way more arm fat. Imagine training upper body only for 12 weeks, like just arms, chest and back. Bro, you'd be looking like that. <laughs> I couldn't do it if you paid me. Fuck that. Make sure you doing everything within proportion. And another group that trained lower body only for 12 weeks lost weight. I really hope this microphone isn't brushing up against my skin and sounding shit. I've been having issues with the audio lately. Anyways. Or leg fat, implying that local targeted fat reduction was at play, which I think maybe it was. Now, an important detail here is that all subjects performed 30 minutes of light cycling after training, implying that perhaps the body does increase fat mobilization from stores nearby the exercising muscle. And if it's burned as fuel immediately after training, this could lead to more net fat loss in that specific area. 
Um, but to me, I think this is mostly just boiled down to a new launching pad for future research. Um, this paper did have a small sample size and is running counter to the general scientific consensus up to this point. Um, so despite impressive findings here, I'm still not confident actually making the recommendation that you can selectively target body fat. And so I'm just gonna leave a highly skeptical question mark on this one for now. So similar to whether fresh or frozen produce is better, uh, which cooking method is best is gonna depend on what specific food you're looking at. Uh, on the whole, it seems that steaming is slightly better for preserving nutrients and boiling seems to be the worst, especially for water soluble vitamins like vitamin C. And of course this supports the general advice that you should avoid high heat and lots of water when cooking. Um, also there's no reason to avoid the microwave. That's a safe technology and can often have favorable effects on nutrition. Um, so generally speaking, I think it has never even crossed my mind that steaming, microwaving, boiling have an effect on the nutrition. I think like a carrot to carrot, no matter how you cook it. Obviously not. There you go. I learned something new. The best advice is to simply have a diet filled with a variety of different fruits and vegetables and try to use a variety of different cooking methods when you can. So I don't personally like the eight glasses per eight day glasses. water recommendation because it doesn't account for the fact that water requirements will vary from person to person. Sorry, I keep pausing it. Isn't it funny? We struggle to have eight glasses of water a day, whether it's true or not, we're about to find out. But if you're out on like the piss, you could smash eight double blacks, which is like 16 standard drinks. It's, I don't know. It really is a mindset thing. You do it for fun and pleasure, but you can't do it for health. I'm guilty of it too. I struggle to drink water. Like even this, I try and smash down at least one or two of these. Based on size, activity level, even geographical location and climate. Uh, so based on pretty much every academic source that I've read, uh, most healthy people can adequately meet their daily water intake by simply using thirst as a guide. And several sources have noted that coffee should count as a water source what? since it doesn't increase urine output or negatively affect hydration status in those accustomed to consuming caffeine. And of course, so pre-work, yeah. <laughs> Of course, since dehydration levels work, as well yeah. as 3% has been shown to impair athletic performance, including strength and power, uh, it's important that strength trainees stay well hydrated. Alan Aragon's research three. review makes a specific pre and intra workout recommendation, uh, but I personally prefer Lyle McDonald's advice that your pee should be clear or slightly yellow throughout the whole day, and you should be peeing about five times a day. Uh, also, increasing water intake has a near negligible effect on metabolic rate, so increasing it past that needed to quench your thirst won't do anything extra for fat loss, of course, unless it helps you feel fuller and reduces your total daily caloric intake overall. Um, so I'd say other than... So what he was saying there at the end is some people drink water to make themselves feel full, so then they don't eat. I've said this many times on my Instagram, my TikTok, is if you're fat and you're trying to lose weight, drink while you're eating food. Because uh, a lot of fat people, the reason why that they are bigger is because their proportion size. Not only what they eat is shitty food, but it's the amount that they eat. So if you give them a plate of this, they're gonna eat that. Or if you give them a small plate, they're gonna eat that. One, proportion, just make it smaller loads of food. Or two, drink while you eat, because it will, it'll fill you up. Whether it's water, milk, that'll fill you up like crazy. Um, but that's what he was saying there, uh, reducing your caloric intake. <sighs> All right, so the battery just died. Um, and this one's probably gonna die too, it's on 4%. So that's great. Um, so the idea that there are three distinct body types or okay. somatotypes, so the endomorph, mesomorph, and ectomorph, is based on some old eugenics riddled pseudoscience from the 1940s, where the goal was to associate each body type with personality, intelligence, future achievement, etc. And it later caught footing in the fitness industry and bodybuilding community. Now, the main issue that I have is that these body type classifications tend to imply that you can't change your body composition or even your body shape over time, which you clearly can. Uh, of course, you can't change your bone structure or the way your muscles insert, uh, but whether you currently look like an endo or an ecto, you will still lose body fat by putting yourself in a caloric deficit and you'll still build muscle through progressive resistance exercise. So let me just use that as an example. If you're an ectomorph, yeah, if you're an ectomorph, which majority of people that watch my stuff are because they're following my journey from going skinny to big, I was most definitely 
skinny as fuck and you know everyone would look at you thinking that you will always look like that bro it took me three and a half four years now started when i was 17 i turned 21 in 14 days that 15 days that's scary as fuck um but anyways it's taken me about four years to get where i am and i've gone from this to this that for me is very impressive and i'm proud of where i've come from but you got to know if you start here you will be able to get to here you're not stuck somewhere. Same as if you're fat. You won't always be that size. Um, and that's what he's trying to say here. There's three, the endomorph, ectomorph, and mesomorph. And majority of you, well, majority of people are either really skinny or really fat. Um, but there's a possibility for you to change and look really good. So just don't let it define who you are, you know what I mean? Just give yourself four years and dedicate everything on your life to changing your body. You'll be sweet. Size while eating sufficient protein calories. And while the actual results may come more and less easily to different individuals based on genetic differences, differences in actual training protocols should be based on specific goals, level of advancement, and personal preference, not somatotypes. Um, so I really I like wouldn't recommend doing a detox diet. Uh, first, they can be dangerous, especially if they have you drinking way more water than you need or excessively restricting foods. Um, their entire basis comes from the faulty physiological assumption that the liver and kidneys need any help clearing out toxins, which they don't. And while they may lead to short-term rapid weight loss for some due to the extreme caloric restriction, uh, these diets are rarely, if ever, sustainable over the long term and often lead to weight regain. And given that there is a huge list of other weight loss diets with adequate protein and micronutrition, pretty much any weight loss diet you can pick at random will be better than even the best detox diet out there. Um, so not a big fan of those. So in other words, don't starve yourself. If you're trying to drop weight from being fat, go in a calorie deficit, but healthy macronutrients. Don't just not eat. And um, same with bulking. Don't just eat a bunch of random shit. Eat, eat Maccas, eat KFC. Like that will put on size, but it's shitty size. And if you fast yourself, that'll drop your weight, but it's so unhealthy. Just do it the correct way, but it will take longer. The problem is people want that instant gratification of I look good now. It's like, you look unhealthy. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta do things correct. Although in my original video, I do discuss what an actual science-based detox diet might look like in the future, if you'd like to check that out. So the last myth actually turns out to probably be not as much of a myth as we once thought it was. Um, as it turns out, the bros were actually kind of onto something when it comes to the mind-muscle connection, as new data shows that you can see significantly more biceps hypertrophy when focusing on establishing a mind-muscle connection. However, this effect may be body part specific since it didn't seem to work as well for the quads in this study. Uh, granted, the subjects were untrained, so perhaps in more experienced bodybuilders who might be better at mindfully activating muscles of their lower body, uh, perhaps you'd see more growth in the quads as well. Um, still, this is a new area of research, so my personal recommendation is to not use the mind-muscle connection for all exercises, but rather just reserve it for isolation, single joint exercises that have rep counts higher than eight. And for everything else, for the most part, you wanna just focus on how your body is executing the movement as a whole, ensuring proper technique and lifting tempo. That's interesting. I thought mind-muscle connection on everything. Although I don't always do it, like when I was repping the 200 on squats, I'll actually see if I can find that video. Um, there was no mind to muscle connection there. That was just straight <laughs> brute strength, get it the fuck up. Otherwise it's gonna kill me. And same with the hack squats. Like lately I've been running up the hack squat. It is leg day, I'll be training legs after this video. And again, I'll put it on the screen. I ate five plates the other day. And although I felt my legs being torn, my main objective in my mind was not feel it on your legs going down, feel it on your legs. It was get the rep count of 10. So like he's saying, you just gotta have a mix and a blend of both, I guess. And it really depends. Like when I go on leg extension, 100%. Like you gotta, you gotta feel the muscle go all the way down, all the way up and tear when you squeeze on it. Same with training calves, same with doing RDLs. You don't wanna just be bouncing down and up. You wanna feel them tear on the way down. So it really depends on your movement, I guess. For me, my analyst on it is if you're going for strength, don't stress too much about mind and muscle. Just do the rep count with progressive overload. But then when it comes to like accessory movements, bodybuilding, shit like that, then really feel the muscle work. But yeah, that's just my opinion. But anyways.
All right, so that's the final eight fitness myths oh, covered, go. and that's gonna be a wrap for this season of Myth Bust Monday. Sweet. All right, so that was the eight gym myths busted. I don't know why, but the count was saying 21, 23. I think he's taken these off another video. I mean, the one that I found the most shocking was how you cook your food. Steaming it, microwave, or boiling. Some suck out the nutrients out of the food, like vitamin C, I think he said, when you boil it. It's like the worst thing to do, which is weird. I don't know how significant it would be, like if you put them side by side someone ate this someone ate this the dramatic changes it would make but if you're really trying to dial down on your diet and you're just going for a show and you want to have that little bit of an edge maybe think about how you cook if you enjoyed this video hit that like button it lets me know you like these type of reaction videos whether they're educational or entertaining i'll probably do a mixture of both with my main content uh, these are just nice and easy to set up plus i learn things if you guys learn anything let me know what you learned in the comments for me obviously it was that cooking thing but i'm sure there's many more science-based videos that he has on here that i will be able to watch and learn a lot more because you should always try and learn never think you know everything because you fucking don't when it comes to training diet mindset work ethic whatever it is you can always learn something new. Make sure you follow me on Instagram. Other than that, keep chasing the filthy pump and I'll see you in the next video.